Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of our Everybody's Yard and Garden Guide seasons for the spring season. And to this evening, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, to provide the program How to Pro Propagate Houseplants and Other Care Tips. So anyway, there are a few joining us yet, so we'll just pause for a minute or so, and then we'll get going. But again, welcome and thank you very much for joining. We've got about 150 of you joining us, so that's, that's great. Well, first of all, I'm Don Kinsler, the Extension Agent for Horticulture here in Cass County. And it's my pleasure to be here talking gardening, and I'll be having a series of webinars uh, starting this evening and on the next number of Wednesday evenings. So if you're uh, wondering about those, where you can uh, register for those, if you just do a search for NDSU Cass County Extension. That will take you to our landing page in which you'll find these events that you can register for. Well, I'm excited to talk about houseplants this evening because it is so fun. I grew up with houseplants and they are just such a healthy, a healthy item uh, for our homes. They help uh, make the air healthier. They can even purify the air. They add humidity. And there are so many healthy things that the plants uh, do for our environment. But also just us caring for the plants. It's good for us. It's good therapy. And also uh, the other thing is when we talk about house plants, uh, it is so much fun to have a few of them in our house. But it's even more fun to have lots of house plants. And this is fun. We've got about 154 of you now. And obviously, the 154 of you that have joined, along with myself and my wife, Mary, all enjoy growing house plants. And uh, one of the fun things, of course, is to start more little house plants off of the ones we've got. And that's what tonight's program is all about. We're going to start about the first half talking about the different ways to start more house plants. And the last half of the program, we'll talk about some general house plant care tips. So, first of all, the different ways to start new house plants. Well, sometimes it's fun if you've got a very nice house plant, it's fun to have more of that same type. But maybe friends, relatives have plants that you'd like a start from. And uh, so it's fun to get a, a new start off of those. And that was probably the way that many of our grandparents, great grandparents got their house plants. Garden centers weren't as common then as they are now. So there were less places to buy a plant. So trading amongst ourselves was a very good way. And that's the way most of our ancestors probably got their house plants. So we're gonna talk about a number of different ways that we can start new ones. Now, the first way is by seeding. African violets can be started by seed. Uh, so if you want hundreds of African violets, that's a good way to get them kind of on the cheap. You can order houseplant or um, African violet seed of different colors, different types. It takes about a year to maybe even a year and a half to get from a seed to a, a nice big blooming size African violet. So it does take patience. One plant that I like to start from seed, in fact, I've already got the seeds going under lights in our basement, are begonias. Now begonias, my wife and I use those outdoor in our containers during the summertime, but also they make a really nice house plant. They're one of the house plants that will provide nice blooms and the begonia is the one on the right there. Uh, begonias really make a nice house plant. A lot of bloom in the sunny window. The seed is very, very tiny. Now the seed photo that's right above the colored red begonia, uh, that picture has been enlarged. Begonia seed is almost as fine as powder. It's, it's dust-like. And to the left of the brownish black seeds are what is called pelletized seed. And again, this has been enlarged. Uh, pelletized seed are still really, really tiny. So I seeded our begonias about a week ago. And but that that's a very nice way to start begonias. They do start well by cuttings too. We'll talk about cuttings. So a couple of house plants 
we can start from seed. Probably not as common as the other methods that I'm going to talk about. This next method is one of the easiest ways to get more houseplants, and it's dividing. And what dividing is, we just simply take the plant out of its pot and split it up into sections. Now, there are certain types of plants that lend themselves well to dividing. So if you take a look at the picture of the snake plant in the middle and the peace lily that's off to the right there, take a look at the growth habit. On both of those, the leaves and stems are all coming from a lower central crown. So if you just take a look down at the point where the leaves meet kind of the soil, there is a crown there from which all those leaves and stems originate. So it lends itself well just to splitting them apart like that division. So here are a couple of ways uh, that you can do division. On the lower left-hand side, we have a fern that um, is just being sawed in two. We could probably saw that one into maybe four or so sections. If you've ever grown ferns, such as the Boston fern, the roots and the crown are so thick and tight that it really does take a saw to get down through that. And then each of those sections can be potted up and we'll have a brand new fern. In the uppermost photo, a snake plant is being split up with a pruning shears so that each of those divisions uh, will have its own root. On the right hand side, we see uh, probably looks like a palm of some sort, and the roots are gently being teased apart there. It's being gently divided, and then each of those uh, will make a new plant. So when you're dividing a plant like that, how many plants can you make out of it? Well, as many little divisions as has a nice root and a nice stem. But oftentimes when we're dividing a plant, most of us are host plants, we would probably take and divide it into maybe four sections. Seems to be a good ballpark number that you can get out. Unless you really wanna start lots of them, then some of these can make dozens and dozens of plants. I should mention that if you have any questions as we go along, uh, we'll have time for questions at the very end. So if you type them in the Q&A, or you could also put them in the chat, I'll, I'll monitor both. But the Q&A is where I'll be checking first, and we'll do those right at the end. So any questions as you're thinking of them, uh, please do feel free to, uh, to add. Okay, our next is called air layering. Now, this is a rubber plant. Air layering works very well on tropical plants that tend to become tree-like. Now, it's interesting. A lot of the house plants that we grow indoors are tropical in nature, and some of them become like trees. So they can tend to have lots of stem. Air layering is a good way to produce a new plant right below the nice upper growth, you know, where all the leaves are. If the rubber plant has become kind of leggy over time, maybe bigger than you like, air layering can create a whole new plant from that top portion. So for air layering, if we start over on the left-hand side, uh, in air layering, we use a sphagnum moss, that's that kind of browny, mossy type material. And usually before you apply that moss to the stem, most indications are that you should cut that stem a little bit to coax rooting, to cut the stem a little bit. And if you do some online searching for air layering, you'll find good detailed methods for that, kind of how much to cut or maybe do a little bark scraping on that. That kind of induces that stem to start producing roots at that point that you've, that you've done a little bit of surgery on it. Before we wrap the moss on, uh, it does help if you use a rooting powder. Now, rooting powder, uh, the garden centers sell those. They're a rooting hormone. They're a white powder in most cases. And in this case of air layering, what you would do would be to take some of that powder and maybe moisten the stem first so it sticks. 
and then just coat a little bit of that powder on the area that you've maybe cut a little or nicked a little bit to induce rooting. Then wrap that area in the moistened moss. Then uh, it takes a little bit of uh, uh, monkeying to do, but kind of with one hand holding that plastic and the moss, you know, that wrap and secure the moss with um, and the plastic with twistum or other fixture. You can see in the middle picture how roots formed. Isn't that nice? Isn't that neat? The roots form in there. Now, it's going to take some time. Um, on some of these plants, it can probably take a couple of months to get decent roots like that. Occasionally, you need to add water. So watch the, the plastic and see if it ever looks like the moss is drying out. If you don't see that moisture accumulating in there, then trickle a little bit of water kind of in up at the top or loosen the top twist them and add a little bit of water. So when you see the plastic well filled with roots like that. Here comes the fun part. Uh, the photo on the right hand side, we take our pruning shears and cut that off below the roots. And there you've got a nice rooted new rubber plant. And if the bottom was all leggy, well, you can cut back that might re-sprout too, but you've got a brand new rubber plant from the process called air layering. Again, do a little bit of online searching and you'll fee find some of the more detailed instructions for that. But that's the, the general concept of air layering. Next, stem sections. Here was a Chinese evergreen, the plant is called, and it was quite old and had gotten quite leggy. So here's what we're going to do. We, we cut off that whole top portion, leggy portion, and notice the stem along there. What I've done is cut it into stem sections, each one maybe about three inches or so long, and we're going to coax that to root. So to do that, here's the rooting powder that I mentioned. So we'll put a little of that in a disposable dish and then moisten the moisten the surface a little bit and that the rooting powder will adhere better. Now in a minute, we're gonna take those stem sections and deal with that. But being a thrifty houseplant owner, uh, we don't wanna dispose of that top. Let's see if we can get that to root. That, that will also root that top like that. So we're going to get uh, lots of plants out of this one. So now in a pail, uh, like an ice cream bucket, I've added um, seeding mix, uh, the type of mix that you would buy at a garden center or hardware store or national chain that's used for starting seedlings that can also be used for rooting cuttings. Or you can use total vermiculite. Uh, vermiculite are those little kind of golden crystals you buy that at um, you buy it at garden centers and vermiculite are little kind of golden flakes like and it works really well for propagating or a seeding type mix usually works quite well too so now i've taken the top off of that spindly chinese evergreen and planted it down in this this uh, pail and it's going to root now let's let's get back to these stem sections. Okay, the stem sections that I cut up, I've rolled in the rooting powder. Next, I planted those down in this media. Then we enclosed that in a plastic bag. Next, I put it under fluorescent lights. We could put it in a window, kind of not so it's getting hot sunlight, but just off to the edge a little, so it's getting good light. And now, um, now the top has rooted. I haven't taken that out of the bucket yet because I want to let it go a little, but I did raise up uh, a couple of these stem sections now no, out, out of the mix where I'd put those. Now notice the white roots that are coming out of the stem sections. Also notice towards the left of the photo, notice the little green sprouts that are coming. So look at that, that from uh, just a, a, an almost dead looking stem section, notice how it started to root and sending up leaf sprouts. So that's gonna be a fun plant so brand new little plant coming out of the older Chinese evergreen. 
So stem sections is certainly a good way on some of that type of plant to start more of them. So our next method is getting houseplants uh, started by cuttings. Now an old um, term for cuttings is slips, taking a slip of a plant. So the plant parts that we could use for uh, starting more plants, on the left there you see African violets. And all it takes on an African violet to start a new one is a leaf cutting. Just leaf, not, not any stem tissue or anything like that, but just the, the broad part of the leaf plus the leaf stem and put down in vermiculite or a seeding type mix uh, and kept moist like that. Uh, it does help if you enclose that in a little plastic bag just to make a greenhouse type effect. And look at the little plantlets coming off of that. And when a person takes each of those clumps out with a fine knife, you can separate each of those little plantlets off as long as it has its own root. And you've got new African violets. One advantage of starting African violets from a leaf like this, a cutting, is that if you start with a nice purple African violet, you're going to get another purple African violet from that. Remember I said you could start African violets from seed. Well, if they're a hybrid type seed, they'll probably get the same color, but if it's a non-hybrid, you might get kind of a mixture. But this type of cutting assures that you're going to get the exact thing that you started with. Now on the right hand side of the picture there, we've got an ivy type. And notice how the leaves come off of stems. So those lend themselves very well to, to what are called stem cuttings. So for those, if we want to start a new plant, we would take tip cuttings. The tip cuttings always seem to root better for me than if you go too farther back. That'll work too. But I like the tip cuttings from all the tips around that plant. And in length, probably three or four inches. And those will make a very nice cutting. So let's take a look at some of the methods for doing that. Now, what if we just take a cutting off of a plant and put it in water? Well, that's the way my mom and grandma started most of their house plants. And this coleus here that I've rooted, you know, they do root, but there, there's a better way. Uh, but I mean, whatever works, we can keep certainly keep doing, but there's a better way. The problem with starting cuttings in water is that the roots that develop are adjusted to water. They, uh, the roots have, uh, get a, used to that environment. And then when you go to transplant that root cutting into potting mix, that mix is foreign to those roots. And so you get more transplant shock. Sometimes it works well, but the success rate seems to be lower for many of us. Instead, if you root those cuttings in, uh, you know, media is the term. Uh, media means just a, a more solid type mix, a seeding type mix, the vermiculite, perlite, things like that, non-water type mixes. So if that same coleus is rooted in a media like that, the roots are already adjusted, the roots that form are adjusted and adapted to that type of mix. So when you go to transplant that cutting, the success rate, the takeoff rate is much better than a cutting that was rooted in water. So that's the type of method that I'm gonna describe next. Now, I like to call this the ice cream bucket method of starting cuttings. I first did this when I was studying horticulture at NDSU. Uh, the basic horticulture class had a lab, and in that lab, we got to start houseplant cuttings. And the method that they used was this, and this that was uh, 40, 45 years ago, and I've used that method ever since. So here's, the, here's what we do with that, this method. Okay, the materials we need is either an ice cream bucket or another similar size bucket. Uh, make sure you punch holes in the bottom so that excess water can drain away. Uh, most of those, of course, have a one 
handle on already, a wire handle. You can add a crisscross wire to help support and make a little more of a greenhouse. You don't have to do that if you don't want. Okay, then next we need a the media. Okay, the media can be a seed starting mix as is shown there, or you could use vermiculite. Whatever mix you use, whatever media you use, make sure you moisten it down well first. All of those materials are very dry coming out of the bag. So make sure that you first moisten it down well, maybe the day before the moisture will penetrate and make it nice and mellow. So that we're not starting with that bone dry, dusty material. The cuttings, as you see down at the bottom of the photo, the cuttings uh, should be probably three to four inches long, stem cuttings, the stem plus a few leaves attached. In one ice cream bucket, you can get probably six or eight cuttings depending on the size of those. When you're taking the cuttings, Again, I like the tip cuttings. They just seem to root better, the cuttings from the tips, outer tips of plants. Remove the lower leaves so that there are a few bare, what they call nodes. The nodes are the raised joints along the stem. So leave the uppermost leaves, remove the lower leaves, and that exposes those bumps or nodes on the stem. And that's where most of the roots are going to form. So next we fill the bucket about oh, half to two thirds full of our media. The one again that I've had the best success with probably is vermiculite. Then we insert the cuttings. Now many of these houseplant cuttings will root fine without the rooting powder, but rooting powder does encourage more roots and kind of more fibrous root. So before we insert the cuttings into the media in the bucket, we can moisten the stems a little bit and then roll them in a little bit of that powder and then insert. Now if you do use the rooting powder, instead of just putting it down in the mix, which could rub off that powder, first make a hole with the pencil or a pen and then insert the cutting in and then firm that mix around the cutting. Uh, we don't want the cuttings to wiggle. If the cuttings are too loose and wiggly, the roots will wear away as they form. So make sure you kind of pat the mix down. And then we can fit in one bucket, probably six or eight cuttings, depending on the size. Then once you've got all your cuttings in, uh, oh, and when you're inserting the cutting, uh, if it's about a three inch cutting, put at least one inch down so that one or two of those nodes, the raised bumps on the stem are down below the mix so that that's where the roots will come. Then we enclose the whole bucket in a plastic bag, not totally sealed. We need a little bit of air, but what that is going to do is create a greenhouse like atmosphere around those cuttings so they won't wilt as much and they just make a wonderful, uh, very root rooting friendly atmosphere. After you've got all the cuttings in there and before you zip it up, water that bucket well. That also helps to firm, firm the mix around the cuttings. And when it's thoroughly watered, the excess, of course, will drain out the bottom. Uh, so you might want to put this on a, a plate of some sort so it doesn't um, get all over everything. But um, be sure that you water it well. And once enclosed in plastic, you're probably not going to have to water that again until the, the cuttings are well rooted. So close in plastic, but leave a little bit of air uh, so that can get in. So where are we gonna put the bucket? Well, if we put it in a sunny window, it would probably be too intense. So a little bit of filtered light or off to the side of a window would be good or under fluorescent lights. Then in two to three weeks, we've got nice roots forming. Now resist the urge to tug on the cuttings, which could break off the roots. So instead with your hands, you know, dig down in and lift the cutting out with your hands so that we don't break off any roots. Now those roots that have formed on that, let's see, I believe it was an angel wing begonia, I think that I started. Um, the roots that form there are well adapted to that solid type mix. So that will transition very well into potting soil with very little transplant shock. So really a really neat way to start cuttings. 
the majority of our house plants can probably be started from cuttings that way, unless the types that divide easily, like we mentioned before, but cuttings is a really great way. Also, if you have any kids that are interested in gardening, this is a great way to get kids involved in gardening. It is fascinating to see those cuttings actually produce roots. And then you can start all kinds of new little house plants. I wanted to take a few minutes to talk specifically, specifically about geranium cuttings. Now, geraniums are so fun. And of course, that's one of the most popular outdoor uh, flowers in the summertime. And we can start lots of geranium cuttings off of a large plant like that. The time of year that they seem to root really well is in late summer, August and September. See on these big potted geraniums that you have outdoors, then the end of summer, August, September, we can take nice cuttings off of those and start lots. And with the cuttings that we take off of those and coax to root, those cuttings we can grow indoors in the wintertime, then they'll be ready for next May. So let's talk about taking geranium cuttings. The ideal geranium cutting is on the left side, a cutting that's about three inches long and only has two main leaves and a little bit of center growth in the middle. So notice when I've taken that cutting off of the old geranium plant, uh, I've taken off the bottom set of leaves. So if you see in that photo, the raised section, the nodes along that stem. Now, geraniums are really susceptible to rot. Geranium cuttings are susceptible to rot before they root. That's one reason why these root better in vermiculite or sand, peat moss, than they would in water. So that cutting that I've taken, uh, I did not use a scissors or a pruning shears. I snapped that from the plant. Now, there was a reason why on geraniums, I, I don't use the scissors or a shears. I just snap the cutting off. And the reason for that, <coughs> excuse me, is that geranium cuttings can rot really easy. And if we're using a scissors to take the cutting, that can transfer the bacteria and the fungi onto that cut surface. And so for that reason, snapping them off prevents the transmission of rotting disease onto that cutting. So beautiful cutting. Now, we could put them in the ice cream bucket, like I mentioned before. <coughs> uh, but they root very nicely in vermiculite or any other mix put in little cell packs. They do really, really well. One reason... Uh, one reason for not putting geranium cuttings in the ice cream bucket is stays really nice and humid. Excuse me, I got a little frog in my throat. <clears throat> it stays really humid in those ice cream buckets, almost too hum humid for geraniums. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's been a busy day of webinars today. So anyway, uh, they do root better with less rot if we put them in... in <clears throat> in individual little packs like like this. <clears throat> now, these are geranium cuttings that my wife Mary and I started uh, this last year. And I took off a couple of leaves so we could so it could be photographed better. So I started them in uh, recycled nursery. They're they're like six packs. And so I put uh, one cutting in each one. What I used here was a mixture of um, sand and peat moss. We could use seed starting mix or vermiculite. So they root really, really nicely. Now it does take two, three, four weeks for them to root. But then when they do, look at what a nice cutting that is. Look at the roots on that. Now that's going to transition into potting mix in a pot beautifully with very little transplant shock. So then what um, Mary and I do is we pot those up into four inch kind of greenhouse type pots and then grow them under fluorescent lights all winter long. And by the following spring, those uh, produce greenhouse quality geraniums for starting again. 
And of course, we usually don't throw out the original plant that was outside, you know, the big mother plant that I got all these cuttings from. We don't throw those out. We actually overwinter the mother plants too. But uh, I do a whole program on geraniums. So tonight's the, not the night for that. But a wonderful way to start geranium cuttings. And from one mother plant in the late summer or fall of the year, you can get dozens of new geranium plants. Uh, geraniums are a fun, fun crop to grow from cuttings. Okay, now we're going to leave the propagation behind a little bit, but feel free to put questions in. I'll have some time to answer those at the end. But we're going to talk about some general care types. So do you have a green thumb? It's surprising how many people mentioned to me, you know, I'd like to grow plants, but I just don't have a green thumb. But that's not true. I always tell them you can. A green thumb is simply giving plants what they need to thrive and grow. And all of us can do that. Experience is the best teacher, just growing plants, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, but also learning about plants. We, we can all do that. So we can all have green thumbs. An interesting concept is that all house plants are native outdoors somewhere. There weren't really any plants created just like here, this is created to be a house plant. No, they're all native somewhere, mostly to the tropics, tropical jungles, or some to the in the deserts, like the succulent cactus types. So they're native somewhere. And if we if we kind of comprehend or look uh, look up where those plants were native, that gives us a clue to their care, to what they instinctively want as their care. Now, here's a good example: African violets. Have you ever heard that African violets, you should not get water on the leaves? Well, that's not entirely true because African violets are native to the tropical rainforests in the Usambara Mountains of Africa. So they're getting water on their leaves all the time. But that water is warm, a nice lukewarm water. As soon as you get chilly water on African violet leaves, it causes spotting and the leaves quickly just droop. So a good uh, case in point of how knowing where those plants are native gives you a clue as to what care they want. And of course, light, very, very important. There's different types of light, of course, for house plants. And when you buy a new one, the plant tag will usually say what type of light it gets. Now, full sun is when a plant would be sitting right there directly in a window with sunshine falling on its leaves. Indirect light is off to the side, or if you've got a shiri type curtain in front of the window, then you can give indirect light. There's a good way to know if your plant is getting enough light, and that's to look, look closely at the leaves and stem. If you bought a new plant from a greenhouse, when you get it home and take a look, the leaves are spaced very, clo very, very closely along the stem. It's compact, it's not leggy. If a plant isn't getting enough light, as you look at the leaves and the stems, the space between the leaves will be wider apart. The plant will have a leggy look. And sometimes on that plant that you bought from the greenhouse and you've grown for a year or so and wondering if it's getting enough light, look back at the central base where it was grown in the greenhouse and look what the distance between leaves should be. And then look what it is in your home condition. If it's kind of like what it was grown in the greenhouse, it's getting a good amount of light. If it's gotten spindly and a lot of distance between leaves, then maybe we need to give it a little more light uh, to prevent that leggy look. Also, light changes with the seasons. Oh, and it's fun. Now in February, that sun is getting higher in the sky. During the winter, when the light is so weak, the sunlight is weak, and the days are short, Mary and I put some of our plants directly in the window so that they get some sunshine. But that same window in July would be way, way too intense. We would get sunlight burning. So it's important to remember that the light changes with the seasons. And sometimes you need to adjust where you've got that plant in the window with the, with the seasons. Now the right size pot. Uh, lots of different types. I like clay pots. They just do well. Plastic pots will work too. The right size pot is important. If the pot is 
too big, plants just wallow in that. Well, we might think, well, if I've got a new little plant, if I plant it in a big pot, then I won't have to repot it so often. But plants seem to have a comfort level in filling the pot with roots. And then we can transplant it into a slightly larger pot. When you do transplant uh, a plant into a new pot, usually about just one inch on either side. So a four inch, if it's in currently a four inch plant, bump it up to a six inch diameter pot. If a young plant is put in too large of a soil uh, mix, it tends to get overwatered and just wallows in way too much soil. So plants have that comfort level of filling it up. Now, uh, selecting potting mix, the highest quality mix that you can buy are usually nice light mixes. You have to water them, mix them up good, add water before you use them so they aren't so dry. But the, uh, the less quality mixes are usually quite heavy in the bag. So the national brands are wonderful. Uh, mixes that your local locally owned garden center or greenhouse would uh, would recommend. Oftentimes they have mixes that they use in their own greenhouse and of course that's the good stuff. So you can ask your locally owned uh, garden center uh, for a good potting mix. So this isn't the area to scrimp on, on cheap. Uh, get a good quality mix. Oh now I love this. Uh, drainage is better in a houseplant pot if you do not put those rocks in the bottom. My mom always did it. Her plants grew beautifully but uh, some of those really knew how to watch the watering. There's been a lot of research done and plants actually drain better without those layer of pebbles. So we can save ourselves work. Now here's the concept behind it. When water goes down through the potting mix, it reaches that layer of change and it senses that and it super saturates the soil above before it drains away. And so your drainage is actually better if you don't have that layer of change. So the best drainage is to fill the pot from top to bottom with good quality potting mix and uh, for, forget the rocks and the stones in the bottom. See, I've just saved, saved uh, myself and everybody else a whole lot of work and scouring the back alleys for a little bit of uh, rocks or pebbles like my mom used to do but her plants grew well too. So if, if you have rocks in the bottom of the pots, you don't necessarily have to take them out, but it does mean you have to watch uh, because those, um, those plants can get waterlogged easier. Now, how do you know if a plant should be repotted? Well, if we slip it out of the pot, if you can see free soil, then it's probably okay for a while yet. But if that pot is so entangled with roots that you see no free soil, then it's time to bump it up to the next size pot. How often do they need repotting? Well, there are Christmas cactuses and jade plants that have been in the same pot for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, most house plants are probably going to need repotting every one, two, three years or so. Now, I like to talk about this, the importance of headspace. Uh, we don't hear this talked about much, but I've I've seen a, a, a very important correlation about what we call headspace. Okay, what is headspace? Headspace is the distance between the rim of the pot and the top of the soil. Notice on this jade plant, it's got a very deep headspace. I, I get a lot of questions on houseplants that are not doing well. And I've noticed a direct correlation between houseplants that are not doing well and a very deep headspace. The pot wasn't filled up uh, as far as it could be with soil. And so, okay, why would that be? Well, if, if it's too deep of a headspace, uh, the soil potting mix tends to stay just wet, poorly drained, poorly aerated, muddy. There's not as much air moving through. But here's the concept. If you have a higher soil profile from a pot that's filled all the way up, uh, gravity is our friend. Gravity will pull that water down through the mix. You get a bigger gravity pull and a better drained mix. So in our houseplant pots, fill it all the way up. Uh, if, you, if it's newly potted plant, 
um, fill it all the way up to the rim, to the edge of the pot. And then when you water it, water it thoroughly, it's going to settle it down so that the final result will only be about a half an inch of headspace. So again, I, I really would like to emphasize that if, if the headspace is deep and the pot is only filled two thirds with soil, you're not getting that gravity pulled down. And so the drainage is actually not as good. Okay, what if the headspace on a plant is too deep? Can we just add some soil on the top? Uh, probably not. That can cause stem rot. So we should take that plant out of the pot, add soil in the bottom of the pot, and then set the plant down at the proper headspace. Would you believe that I started these two spider plants at the same time from little baby spiders? I like to call this the importance of intentional care. You know, when we have pets, we give our pets intentional care. We just don't kind of leave them off to the side and give them a little food and all that. If we give them care and intention, uh, they respond. Plants do the same thing. I started those two spider plants the same. The one on the left, the bigger one, I fertilized it. I repotted it at, in due time. I gave it intentional care. The one on the right didn't die. I watered it kind of when it needed it, but I didn't give it the extra care. I didn't give it fertilizer during the spring and summer. And look what a difference that makes. Started the same exact day from similar size little spiders. So intentional care. Our house plants respond to intentional care the same way that pets do. Okay, watering is one of the most challenging aspects of houseplant care, especially until we develop some experience with those plants. And of course, chemicals in water can cause tip burn. Chlorine and fluorine are common causes of tip burn. And some plants are more susceptible, like spider plants, uh, peace lily is another very susceptible. It does help if you let the water uh, stand overnight. It's kind of debatable whether some of those chemicals are really going to evaporate enough, but it certainly doesn't hurt to let the water stand stand for a day. Oh, but rainwater. Rainwater is wonderful for plants and melted snow. My mom always had a, a pail of snow thawing on the radiators at home for her house plants. How to tell if a house plant needs watering? Well, you might think, gosh, that one looks like it's awfully dry. But now the interesting thing is a plant that is overwatered could have its roots all rotted away and then it wilts because it doesn't have any roots left. So a wilting doesn't always mean that it needs more water. There's a couple of ways to tell. Okay, the weight of a plant. It's surprising on a, a smaller plant. If you just lift it up, you can kind of gauge the difference in pot weight um, and then water that plant thoroughly, lift it up a little bit. And then sometimes you can just by lifting it, tell the weight of a dry pot. But the finger test is probably the most reliable. Just inserting the finger up to the first joint and feeling, is there moisture at the fingertip? If so, the plant probably has enough moisture. Wait a day or so. Uh, if it's dry at the fingertip, then go ahead and water. The important concept is for most plants, anytime we provide water, apply enough so the entire soil ball becomes wet and then discard any that drains out. I'm oftentimes asked, how, how often should we water plants? You know, how, you know, once a week, twice a week? Uh, there are too many variables. Uh, the heat in the room, uh, the light, the size of the pot, the type of plant. So we can't water on a schedule. We can't say, uh, we can't say to someone else, you need to water twice a week. But you, it's important to check the plants on a schedule. I check ours every uh, Wednesday and Sunday. And if they're dry, then go ahead and water. If they aren't dry, then you know wait a day or so. But do check them on a schedule, but not necessarily water on a schedule if they don't need it. You can look at the visual appearance of the soil. Most of the potting mixes become light in color uh, when they're when they're uh, getting dry. And then you can give it the finger test too. Fertilizing house plants. House plant growth responds to the day length and the amount of light that they're getting. So in the winter, some of these plants kind of hunker down and they don't really need a whole lot of extra nutrition. So it's important to save our fertilizing, 
when the days get long, the light gets better, starting really in about February or March. Then we can fertilize once or twice a month, um, following the label directions, of course, all the way spring, summer, fall, and then around September when the days start getting short, then maybe not fertilize. An exception is African violets and blooming type plants. Now we're gonna quickly take a look at a couple of houseplant insects. Now these are spider mites. Uh, I should say spider mite damage and spider mite uh, signs, the webbing. If you take a look at the leaves, the little tiny white dots, that means spider mites have been sucking the sap of those plants. Spider mites are so tiny that you can usually not see them on plants. If you take a white sheet of paper and flick the leaves on, and then with a magnifying glass, look at the little tiny specks, those are spider mites. So usually we see the damage long before we see the little mite themselves. By the time you see damage like this with the webbing and all the little, uh, the little markings on the leaves, this plant really is not going to recover very well. And so important to, uh, to be looking for spider mite injury. Uh, early on. Aphids, if you notice the white, uh, aphids can also be green or brown, or reddish. They tend to congregate up in the growing tips of plants and on the leaves. They exude a sticky substance. Do you notice how the leaves have kind of a shiny substance? That's the sticky honeydew. And you oftentimes will feel that on the table around where the plants are growing as well. They're sucking the sap out of the leaves. Mealybugs. Mealybugs are the white cottony growth. They're a slow moving insect that has encircled themselves with that cottony material to protect themselves from any insecticide that we try to apply. So what are we going to do with some of these insect problems. Well, systemic insecticides are a good choice. Systemic insecticides are uh, granules that are applied to the soil following label directions. The roots take up the, the product and then as spider mites or aphids or mealybugs start sucking the sap, the insects are killed. So it protects the plants from the inside out. So it's a, a good, uh, really a good protective measure, especially against like spider mites that are so difficult to see until it may be too late. Insecticidal soap works good. Now insecticidal soap must contact the little insects in order to uh, kill them. It doesn't have residual. So it needs to be applied fairly oftenly and it needs to actually coat those little bugs uh, with the soap and then it can be quite effective. But again, it, it's not really a preventative. Now, here, here's one that I think we can all relate to, those annoying little black uh, flies that flit around our house plants. <laughs> those are called fungus gnats. On the yellow trap there, you can see, see them, and they are so annoying. They create a life cycle in the soil. So the black flies, little black fungus gnats, they lay eggs in the soil. The eggs hatch into larvae. The larvae hatch into more adults and you get a life cycle going. So you could spray the fungus gnats that you see, but, okay, that would kill those, but they've already laid eggs in the soil and the eggs in the soil cause more adults. So you can constantly be trying to spray and it doesn't uh, solve the situation, but there's a good remedy. That's the product called mosquito bits. And if you look on the label, it says also controls fungus gnats. Mosquito bits is a great product. It's a beneficial bacteria, you add the, uh, the little granules to the soil, and the beneficial bacteria attack the larvae. You see the adult flies laid eggs, eggs hatch into larvae, and that larvae is what these beneficial bacteria kill. So it breaks this life cycle. So it may take a little bit to, to go into effect, but the life cycle of fungus gnat will be will be killed. Uh, you'll break that life cycle and eventually um, you'll get them under control. Now, our last two slides here, I added just for a little bit of trivia, Christmas cactus. Now, you've probably heard that there are Christmas cactus and there are also Thanksgiving cacti. There's also Easter type. 
But take a look, close look at these stem pads. They don't really have leaves, they have stem pads. Notice the smooth lobes on these. This is the true Christmas cactus. Most of the long time old uh, ones that we inherit from parents, grandparents, great grandparents are the true Christmas cactus. Now take a look at this one. Notice the stem pads have that tooth on that that at each joint they have these barbs, these teeth. Those that is the Thanksgiving cactus. It's actually a different species from the Christmas cactus, even though the blossom look kind of similar. A lot of the of these plants that are sold now in the greenhouse trade are actually Thanksgiving cactus. They have a trigger. Uh, that triggers them into blooming a little earlier than Christmas cactus, so the sales are better. So uh, again, notice the difference. So as people are sharing on Facebook their Christmas cactus, sometimes they know it's a Thanksgiving cactus, but take a close look to see, is it actually a Christmas cactus or is it the Thanksgiving cactus? The care is much the same, but it's kind of fun. Well, the wonderful world of houseplants. I love it. Now, I'm going to leave this uh, contact information up here. If there's anything you'd like to contact me about on uh, gardening type questions, feel free to email me. And now we're going to go to the chats. So uh, if at any point you want to sign off, I want to thank you for joining us. And thanks for bearing with me while I had that little frog in my throat. Uh, so again, Don Kinsler, Cass County Extension, NDSU, and we're going to go to the question and answer box. But again, for anybody that does need to leave, I really appreciate your joining us. Okay, I'll start at the top here. I'm carefully caring for many outdoor uh, uh, house plants. We're going to be gone. Uh, going to be gone. Okay, any suggestions? Uh, for keeping plants in the house. Uh, temperature will drop to 62 degrees. That's perfect. Okay. In the garden column on Saturday, we actually are going to talk about this in the question and answer. Uh, a method that works really well is to group your house plants together in a spot that's going to get filtered light, not direct sunlight, and then with a clear plastic film, the kind of the type that painters use, uh, that clear plastic film um, cover the cover the plants with that water them well first you know drain off any excess uh, cover them in that plastic and then fasten it down well around the edges uh, someone just emailed me the reason I'm talking about in the garden column is they emailed me and said we tried this wow and it worked for about three weeks while we were gone so if you're going to be gone for 20 days this method should keep you covered so what are the pros and cons for rinsing off the dirt before you divide the root ball into smaller sections? I think that's a good idea when you divide to rinse away. What that will help do is get rid of fungus gnats that might be there. You're causing a little bit of disruption, but that's probably a good idea. The other thing you're doing with rinsing away the old potting mix, potting mix tends to accumulate salts, fluorine, chlorine, other salts out of the water. So by rinsing it away, you're getting rid of some of that. Okay, next. Does root hormone powder get old? I have one container from a few years ago. Should I get a new one? Uh, if it's kept dry, then usually they're fine. They have a shelf life of probably at least three years. Uh, the fresher, the better, but uh, I think you'd be in pretty good, pretty good shape. Uh, they do have a shelf life. Uh, what is the purpose of putting a plastic bag over the plant? Is it necessary, like for doing cuttings? Uh, is necessary in all plants or only certain types of plants. When a person uh, takes a cutting of a plant, you're cutting it off of its root system. And also that plant that was leggy, that Chinese evergreen that I'm rooting the whole top, uh, we're totally severing it from its root system that supplied water. So the reason for putting those those um, those plant parts that no longer have roots to feed them water, uh, for putting them in plastic is to keep the humidity up. So there's less chance of wilting on those. Okay, for the stem cuttings, were they completely buried in the soil? For those stem cuttings that did not have any leaves, yes, they were just barely covered with potting mix. If cuttings have leaves, of course, then you leave the leaves above the mix and just put the, the stem part below.
I have an orchid that has sprouted two babies. What is the best way to separate those into additional orchids? Okay, uh, they are, will be attached to the mother orchid. So a sharp knife uh, will sever them off. Now, orchids are fascinating. They don't have a whole lot of roots on. Uh, oftentimes they'll have aerial roots sticking up out of the pot. And um, that, that's good. Now with orchids, it's very important that you buy an orchid type mix. Uh, orchids grow on rotten trees in the tropics. And so the orchid type potting mix is going to be mostly bark chunks. Uh, so get a good orchid type mix from the garden center. Approximately long, how long does it take for African violet to root after cutting? In African violets, you just take a leaf, uh, the wide part of the leaf with a leaf stem, and it's probably going to take uh, the better part of a month before you see a little uh, plantlet arising. Um, the roots might come quicker, but if you're too anxious and disturbed down in to see if it's rooting, then that delays. So it's probably going to be at least a month or more before you see a new little plantlet coming up out of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, the next question. Uh, should I... Uh, let's see, I, I'm not familiar with that plant species. Uh, that one I might have to come back to. Do the toilet paper rolls also work well with seed starting for geranium starts? I've grown discouraged with the flats being plastic, not many years per flat. Yes, you can use toilet paper rolls. Uh, you don't need the whole length, but you can cut them in half and they will uh, they'll stay supported enough to uh, work for geranium cuttings. So yes, yeah, so a toilet paper roll cut in half and put in a tray filled with the rooting media, that would work for geranium cuttings. Okay, when you mention fluorescent lights, are you talking about just plain fluorescent lights or the ones specifically designed as grow lights? Both. Uh, many plant seedlings will grow just fine. Uh, we use, just because we've had them a long time, we use fluorescent shop lights. Uh, just regular, uh, these are eight foot long with two fluorescent tubes. Uh, I try for a cool white and a warm white. Uh, under, but there are all kinds of new LED lights and LED plant lights, and they are wonderful. So you can do under fluorescent lights, that works well. Uh, the LEDs and specific plant lights work well too. So lots of good choices. Is it too late for geranium cuttings? No, I didn't didn't take the cuttings back in the fall. It They'll certainly root now. So go ahead, if you've got a geranium plant, go ahead, take the cuttings now and the method we suggested. Uh, they're going to take a little longer to develop to root and develop into a good plant. So instead of being ready for May, it might be the middle of summer, but I would go ahead. I would certainly go ahead. Okay. When did you start the geranium cuttings? August or September. Um, Okay, should Christmas cactus be repotted with succulent soil or regular potting mix or houseplant mix? Ah, good question. Now we need with Christmas cactus to take a look at where they were native. Uh, the word cactus is a little deceptive because they're not a desert type cactus that would grow in sand. Instead, Christmas and Thanksgiving cactus are tropical cactuses that grow on deteriorating uh, trees, uh, humus -y type thing. So uh, actually a well-drained uh, potting type soil, potting type mix is probably better than a succulent type mix, but it's gotta be very well-drained because they are a cactus and they uh, can be overwatered easily. So um, one thing you might do is use a regular potting mix, add more vermiculite or something for extra drainage, but that peat moss in those is beneficial. It kind of gets them back to their, uh, their native roots. Okay, any tips on repotting large plants? I have a bird of paradise. Wow, that's so a bird of paradise are beautiful, over six feet tall and glorious. It, it is breaking out of the plastic liner it came in. I'm afraid of repotting and damaging. So those are pretty much a repotting on the floor. So to get that, uh, of course, plastic down uh, always helps on the floor first and then scoot the plant over onto the plastic and then uh, Take, break, it sounds like the pot's already cracking. So break that away and get your new pot and soil right there. Have someone help lift it. Um, 
and only go you know a couple of inches bigger in pot than it is right now. Um, and maybe try to get a little of the old soil off so that a little bit of fresh soil would put. But yeah, I, I can appreciate that. You hate to disturb uh, in the wrong way a big plant like that, but yeah, with a little care, it'll, it'll work well. Uh, fillers and pots, are pine cones okay to use? Fillers and pots. So maybe referring to like a big outdoor planter where you don't want to put so much potting mix in, but you want to take up some space. Okay, and yeah, pine cones would be okay. Some people use pots, milk jugs. Now remember, in house plants, we don't want that layer of change because that can make plants get overwatered. Now outdoors, we can get by with putting stuff down in the bottom of pots because outdoors, uh, the issue isn't usually having the plants get too wet. The issue outdoors is usually keeping plants wet enough because they tend to dry out. So uh, you yeah, have pine cones. I've never heard of pine cones being used as fillers down in pots, but uh, I think they would work. They'd eventually break down, of course. Any tips on propagating succulents? Uh, succulents, uh, many of them will root fine from cuttings. And um, the mix has to be very, very well drained, such as sandy. How to get rid of fungus gnats or avoid having them? Okay, in fungus gnats, um, the two approaches one is to use a houseplant spray, insecticidal spray, that'll knock down the adults or use those yellow sticky traps, but also. Uh, get the material called mosquito bits, mosquito bits. Uh, garden centers, some have them, uh, hardware stores sell mosquito bits and put that in the soil. That will break the cycle because they're very, very common in houseplant soil, even from reputable sources. Will you be offering a geranium webinar? Um, prob maybe in the fall. How about if I do that in the fall when it's time to overwinter and also take cuttings. Good idea. I'll do that in the fall. So stay tuned. Thanks. Uh, what method of propagation would work best for string of pearls rosary plant? Oh, beautiful succulent. Uh, on those, if you can divide them, that will work. If it's formed multiple shoots coming out of the crown, that will work. Uh, but also they will root from uh, taking uh, sections, which will, will be kind of little strings of pearls and then put the uh, the base down in, they will root. Uh, let's see, okay, would, would you do a lesson on succulents? Yeah, at some point, I, I probably will not be doing that this, this spring, but at some point uh, that might be next year on succulents. Would African violet potting mix have enough drainage to propagate a cutting from a flaming violet? African violet mix is quite well drained and it is high in peat moss, things root well in peat moss. So I would say if you have African violet potting mix, that should, uh, your flaming violet should root in that. How often do you water succulents in winter? Oh, that's a good, 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 good question. And of course, the reason they are succulents is because they've got a waxy coating and they store water within themselves so well. So how often do you water succulents in wintertime? Uh, many plants, including succulents, hunker down in wintertime. So uh, once a month. It kind of depends on if it's in a sunny window or not sunny, you know, if it's under lights or in a bright sunny window. Um, but probably once a month, every three to four weeks might be enough. It's hard to give an exact deadline or a timeline on those. If you see a fungus gnat periodically, like maybe once a week, do you need to do mosquito bits? Well, the tricky thing about fungus gnats is they lay hundreds and hundreds of eggs. And so uh, a couple of fungus gnats can quickly become a problem. So if you see any, I would do the mosquito bits. Again, the mosquito bits are beneficial bacteria, don't harm, they won't harm pets, uh, they won't harm humans. Uh, they're one of the friendly guys. Uh, okay, especially if you have 150 plants or so. Yes, bless you. 150 plants is wonderful, but yep, if you see a, a fungus gnat or two, I, I definitely do some control. Although if you've got 150 plants, that's gonna be tough to know where to put them. Maybe in that case, try the yellow sticky traps to try to catch the adults. When is the best time to propagate cuttings or does it not matter because they're indoor plants? Oh, plants sense day length. So right now is a great time to start cuttings because uh, unless you're keeping them under fluorescent lights, uh, they'll sense the lengthening days and that helps stimulate rooting too. 
Uh, okay, I also have a bird of paradise that has never bloomed. Do I need two plants for pollination? Uh, pollination would affect the seed that would be produced, but it doesn't affect flowering. Uh, so two plants wouldn't coax the flowering, but it, it could coax if cross-pollination was needed, that would affect the seed that would come out of the flowers. So no, a bird of paradise, uh, they have to be really, really happy. Uh, it takes a lot of patience too. I'm not sure how old your bird of paradise plant is, but with patience, uh, if it's growing well, good leaves, good light, eventually they will bloom. My Thanksgiving cactus bloom too early. If I leave it in the dark, will bloom later when the buds start to appear. Okay, uh, Thanksgiving Christmas cactus are triggered into bloom by two factors. The most reliable is cool temperatures. The other thing is short day length. So the most reliable trigger is cool temperatures. The reason our grandmothers always bloomed reliably is they had them probably in the good living room where it got really chilly at night and that triggers blossoming. And also uh, maybe move that Thanksgiving cactus closer to a cool window and uh, it'll have a little chilly microclimate there at night and that can trigger. Or uh, another thing in the fall, leave it out when temperatures are getting below 50, not freezing, but uh, that will also trigger the eventual um, uh, flower bud formation for Thanksgiving. Uh, and you mentioned it bloomed too early. Uh, will okay, so yeah, it uh, if it bloomed too early, maybe it got that chilling a little bit earlier, but again, um, yeah, so sometimes sometimes they bloom when they want to. Many people's bloom several times. What is my favorite house plant? Ferns. I love rabbit's foot fern just because they're so fun. Uh, I really love ferns, you know, and sometimes we think, gosh, they're kind of messy. But, you know, many of our pets are messy, too. So if I had to pick a favorite house plant and prayer plant. I love prayer plants. It's fun at night. They kind of fold up a little bit uh, uh, from whence they get the name. What's the best way to propagate a Christmas cactus? Stem, um, stem cuttings, you take a couple of those pad sections and in vermiculite works very well or sand too uh, or a succulent type mix would work too. And you just barely put a little of that mix over the the end where you snap the pad off. Uh, they don't have to be very deep or shouldn't be very deep. Can you re recommend a good brand of soil? I like miracle Grow potting mix because you can buy it almost anywhere. miracle Grow potting mix uh, is what Mary and I use for most of ours, but also the garden centers have brands that they use and those are equally as good. Uh, is there any way you can get an ivy to branch out instead of just one long vine? Yeah. To, um, yes. Uh, pruning back. And of course, sometimes that's hard to do. You hate, oh gosh, I hate to cut all these long uh, vines back. But ivy can be coaxed to uh, do better branching by pruning it way back. Because where you had one shoot, it'll encourage two to grow in that spot. So you can double the amount of branching by pruning back. And uh, about now, do that now because the increased day length will help stimulate better branching also. So pruning back, but don't throw away those prunings. You can root those, take stem cuttings of those. Uh, why would my snake plant start getting yellow leaves? Too much water? Usually. Snake plant are a succulent. So uh, with um, snake plant and other succulents, it's always better to err on the dry side. Uh, too much water oftentimes causes yellow leaves. My paddle plant is getting horrible spots on leaves and generally looking very stressed. Repotted, very little roots. I use a meter to check for moisture. What am I doing wrong? Um, repotted, very little roots. So oftentimes when, when something is happening, uh, moisture is oftentimes, I, even though moisture meter is saying water, uh, they can't always distinguish between different types of plants unless it's a very sophisticated moisture meter. I have a feeling it's probably staying a little too continually too moist. So try letting it dry out a little, a little longer. I have over 50 plants in my house. Oh, that's awesome. I have uh, mealybugs in a few of them. I use rubbing hall with squirted dawn, uh, just open water. Ah, uh, it's worked some, but not others. What would you do to get rid of them? And how many plants could they possibly move to? Mealy bugs can infest plants fairly 
uh, fairly rapidly. And the rubbing alcohol uh, will penetrate, that will help. I would really try the systemics, uh, the systemic granules, because that uh, causes the sap to be poisonous to the mealybugs. What is causing blackening leaves on my philodendron? Uh, well, there are different diseases, but uh, if it hasn't been repotted for a while, I would repot and look at the roots, see if the roots are good and healthy, or if there's some rot happening on the roots as well. I, I would try repotting that into some fresh, high quality soil. Also check to make sure that the pot isn't too big. Where do you get plastic Ziploc bags that fit into an ice cream pail? Yes, that took some searching. Okay, so what I do instead is anytime I find a clear plastic bag that's big enough for an ice cream bucket to fit in, I save it. Uh, for example, um, paper plates. Uh, if you buy like 500 paper plates uh, at the at at the uh, at Walmart or any other national chain, oftentimes those products come in big clear plastic bags. So I always save those uh, for when I want to uh, root a ice cream ice cream bucket. Uh, so it doesn't need to be a Ziploc. We can fasten the top of other size clear bags too. How do you root a jade plant from a leaf? Uh, jade plant, you can use either just a leaf or a stem section with several leaves on too, but you can just use one leaf and just cut the, uh, or just tuck the, the um, what, what do I say, the, the cut end, uh, the, the lower part of the leaf, uh, just barely tuck that in sand or a well-drained potting mix. Uh, Okay, and eventually they will root, even if the new little uh, pup, as you mentioned, but they, they will root. Okay, I have a ZZ plant, uh, ZZ raven, that I hope to say, those are beautiful plants. If you aren't familiar with a ZZ plant, uh, investigate them, they're beautiful. That I hope to separate into two plants. They seem to like to be crowded. Many plants do. And as you as we mentioned, uh, plants don't like to be into too big of a pot. They seem to be like to be crowded a little. Um, as, I, as two separate plants, should they be in a bit smaller pot? And if you do divide those, do certainly put them in a smaller pot. Um, and again, to separate those, sometimes a sharp knife where they're uh, where they're joined together. If you saved a petunia plant from the summer and it's died off, will it come back in the spring if planted in the ground in the spring, uh, possibly from seeds dropped? Uh, petunia plants um, in a milder climate, they are a perennial that would come back. But of course, in our area, they aren't winter hardy enough, uh, but they do come back from seeds that they've shed around the mother plant. How do you propagate a jade plant? A jade plant can be propagated just from one single leaf that you put down in a very well-drained potting mix so that the end is just barely covered, or you can take a stem section. Stem sections are quicker. So a stem section about three inches long and to remove the lower leaves and insert about one inch down into that ice cream bucket method. Uh, that's my favorite way of starting jade plants. You get a, a bigger, plant quicker than just starting with one single leaf on jade plant. I have a lot of plants. I've tried for two years to have a Rex begonia. No luck. Do you have tips for the, the plant? Rex begonias are, are beautiful. Uh, make sure they don't stay too wet. Begonias actually like to air a little bit on the dry side. So if uh, having problems with uh, Rex begonia, oftentimes it's because the soil is staying maybe a little too moist. What conditions do I do to help my Monstera produce fruit? Ah, uh, Monsteras produce a well, actually, the uh, botanical name is Monstera deliciosa because of the delicious fruit. And so uh, Monstera, when they're very happy and reach a certain age, they will produce a flower followed by a fruit. So uh, if the plant's growing well, uh, plenty of humidity, good light, if the leaves look good with enough patience, you should get a flower and a fruit. I have a ropoia that has two long stems. How do I get it to push out more growth in the middle? Okay, to get it to get more growth down in the middle, you almost have to cut it back. Um, and um, you could try increasing the light, but oftentimes a pruning back is needed to uh, cause more growth in the middle. 
we brought in Swedish ivy in the summer. They uh, got root rot. Is there anything we can do to prevent this from happening? Uh, Swedish ivy have a fairly uh, thick leaf, uh, so they conserve moisture internally. So if it's getting root rot, make sure it isn't in too big of a pot. Keep the pot somewhat small so that they aren't wallowing in too much soil. And then, of course, let them dry out really good in between thorough waterings. I have friends that I now wish, boy, I think we're at the last question. I have friends that I now wish had participated in this session. Is it available after tonight? Uh, the reason we don't broadcast the, um, the recordings is because people tend to not join live. And most of us don't get around to listening to every webinar that we would like to. You know, we all have good intentions. And so... Um, but we did record this, and so at a certain point to those who uh, registered here, <coughs> excuse me, I am going to send out the recording link that you could share with friends. So thank you. I do think we have reached the end of our questions. Uh, let's see, except there are also some in the chat box uh, as well. <coughs> Uh, let's see. Hey, I could quickly. Uh, uh, let's see. How, how often do you water the cuttings? Okay, um, cuttings on geraniums. Let them dry out quite a bit in between. I'll try to run through a couple of these and the other. Some questions were in the chat, some in the Q&A. Uh, have you been able to get new plants from variegated snake plants from leaf sections? No, variegated snake plant um, will root from a cutting, but uh, it loses the variegation. So a snake plant to keep them variegated have to be done by divisions. That's kind of a nice science project. How do you treat and prevent spider mites? The best way really is, okay, a lemon tree. Uh, systemic insecticide is really good, or you really have to be treating them religiously with insecticidal soap or washing off. What causes blackening leaves on a philodendron? I think we did that one. Uh, uh, false bottoms in a pot, a good idea. Uh, as long as the drainage is good. You know, sometimes we can put one pot inside another pot and that can work good. Why does my spider plant leaves have dead dry ends? Uh, spider plants are very susceptible to fluorine chlorine in the water. And so uh, with spider plants and also peace lily, uh, it's best to use distilled water, rainwater, snow water, save enough of that just for spider plants and peace lily. They, uh, because they do get those dry ends uh, frequently from material and water. They're very uh, susceptible to, the, to that. Uh, let's see, okay, I think we got that one. Okay, uh, trying to save an old th Thanksgiving cactus by rerooting leaves. Uh, Okay. Uh, so anyway, the three leaves uh, hints on rerooting a Thanksgiving cactus. Yeah. So if you've got the three leaves, yep, just barely cover the 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 cut cut end. I guess am I saying that right? The the part where it came off of the plant. Uh, just barely cover that with vermiculite sand or other material, and try the the ice cream bucket method. Works quite well on geraniums, or I mean on uh, Thanksgiving cactus. Okay, uh, okay, good, um, good. I think we, uh, let's see, tulip bowls from last fall, forgot to plant them. Uh, and now a few have started to sprout. Uh, pot those tulip bulbs up and uh, they, they must have met their dormancy. So pot them up right now. Hopefully you'll get some bloom from them. Uh, thank you for the kind uh, comments. I think we, think we're, uh, ponytail palm, brown dead leaves. How do we need to repot ponytail palm? They like humidity, so maybe try to increase humidity. And but uh, replanting only every couple of years should should be susceptible or should be sufficient. Uh, okay, uh, mealy bugs uh, growing more leaves on a skin dapsis. Again, pruning back some of these is really the only way to encourage some of these 
Uh, is it frowned upon to cut slips from your <laughs> workplace? It, it is. That and botanical gardens. Uh, yeah, frown on that. We have reached the end of our questions, I believe. Again, thank you very much. Uh, 72 of you hung with us till the bitter end. Again, thank you very much. I appreciate your joining on these webinars. These are fun. And next week's webinar is uh, on starting seeds indoors. So I hope you can make it. And again, thank you for joining me this evening. Mm -hmm.